Thank you, Heinz. Uh, sounds like my uh, mic's working OK. Is that right? OK, well, um, probably the, the first thing I should uh, mention is a little bit about my background. Uh, as Heinz uh, mentioned, I was an evolutionist until I was 40 years of age. And this is even though I grew up in the church. Uh, I was an elder in the church at uh, the age of uh, 40. And it, was, it wasn't until that time that anyone even introduced me to the concept that the Bible might be true, um, even though I went to church all those years. By that I mean that uh, if, the church is, if the Bible is foundationally incorrect, which uh, current secular science tells us, then uh, why would we believe any of the rest of it? Uh, Genesis chapters 1 through 11 uh, from a logical standpoint, are the foundation for the rest of the Bible. And so if we can reject that, why not reject the rest of it, or at least just accept that which matches up to what you'd like to believe is the truth. And that's what I did. And uh, so until the that time, uh, I, I was, uh, as an analytical thinker, I was thinking that the main purpose for a church was to allow uh, good people to get together and have a good time. And so uh, now, uh, after uh, have been introduced to creation science, I, uh, I was able to uh, you know, accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and then get uh, excited about this particular ministry of showing people how a lot of the general uh, revelation from God, that is his creation, matches up perfectly well with his special revelation, which is his Bible. So uh, the topic is uh, polystrate fossils. And uh, uh, poly means many, of course, and straight uh, is from the word strata. And any, any fossil which crosses two or more sedimentary layers when we're looking out in the geology is called a polystrate fossil. Polystrate fossils have been found at locations all around the Earth. And uh, polystrate fossil trees are commonly found in coal mines. Uh, Polystrate trees were first discussed in, uh, by geologists in the 1820s and 1830s. OK. Did it go away on you, huh? Okay, I'll try not to move anything. <laughs> All right. So, um, there were uh, these polystrate trees were first uh, found or discussed by geologists in the 1820s and 1830s. And uh, at that time, of course, we had the uh, geologists who were wanting to uh, use geology as a means for uh, minimizing the church. Uh, they wanted to get education out of the church. And so one way to do that would be to bring the, into question uh, the Bible. But also there were at that time uh, what we call scriptural geologists, such as George Young, George Fairholm, and William Rind. And they, they argued that these polystrate uh, fossils were evidences from the worldwide Genesis flood. By the 1840s, however, the uniformitarian uh, view of, of uh, lawyer Charles Lyell became most popular as the explanation for them, not only outside the church in the secular world, but also inside the church. Now, this is a photo of a fossilized tree in Tennessee that pierces numerous layers of shale and coal. This is what we would call a polystrate fossil tree. In this picture, uh, in this photo, and this is in the same area as the last one, we see three fossilized poly polystrate trees. Now, uh, I've got the orange arrow pointing at the tree here. And here you see the extent of this poly fossilized tree. Here are the arrows pointing at a tree that runs from about here down this way. And then here is the 
third uh, fossilized tree here. This is an actual growing tree right here. This is, that's, that's not fossilized. Here we see an exact mold from one of the Tennessee polystrate trees. Now, according to evolutionary uniformitarian theory, the sedimentary layers that we see there, as you can see, there's these layers running horizontally and then some uh, tilted down here a little bit. Those layers from, from the uh, bottom to the top, according to evolutionary theory, represent two million years of time. Now, of course, the biblical creationist view was, and still is, that the layers formed within hours or days. So we have quite a difference of opinion. Here we see a fossil tree uh, extending through numerous sedimentary layers, and this is in the country of Germany. We see, see here two horizontal lines. Uh, these arrows point to uh, the distance from this arrow to that arrow is one meter, or a little over three feet, to give you an idea of scale. Now, according to the uniformitarian interpretation, the combination of the layers represents millions of years of sedimentary deposition, and the tree is in situ, that is, it's exactly as it was when it grew prior to its petrification. Let's look uh, at the contrary biblical creationist explanation. What we, what we would explain it, uh, this particular polystrate tree, is that we would say, had that tree been buried slowly over long periods of time, the top of the tree would have decayed. In addition, the tree could not have grown up through the strata because it would have lacked sunlight and air. And so the only plausible interpretation is that the tree was rapidly buried in line with the biblical creationist view that these sedimentary layers were laid down during the Genesis flood. So polystrate fossils are just one of the evidences that I believe indicates the blind faith that exists on the part of those who cling to the secular religion of evolution and millions of years. Polystrate fossils are both positive evidence for a rapid sedimentary deposition and also evidence against the validity that the present is the key to the geologic past, which is the principle of uniformitarianism. Well, now let's look in more detail regarding polystrate fossils and petrified forests at six specific locations around the world. Uh, six areas are Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. Then we're going to move to the Joggins Fossil Cliffs uh, near in uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. Then we're going to look at some Alaska coal mines. Then we're going to move to the Pisco Formation of Peru, then back to Wyoming for the Green River Formation, and finally, or we're going to slip into Slick Rock, Colorado. Now in Yellowstone National Park in northwest Wyoming are found petrified forests where trees are found that have been turned to stone. And you see a couple of them uh, clearly in this slide. The traditional secular explanation for these petrified forests has been that they represent a series of consecutive forests each, each requiring hundreds of years to grow before being buried by separate volcanic eruptions. It would require many tens of thousands of years for the forest to be deposited, the trees to petrify, and then to be exposed by erosion. So here we see a depiction of the orientation and the relative locations of these proposed forests where up to 50 sedimentary layers are stacked on top of one another. Each layer contains petrified trees in both upright and horizontal positions. And this scenario was used for decades as definitive proof of the inaccuracy of the Bible so far as the age of the earth. In fact, there are numerous documented testimonies of Christians who left the faith just simply because of this so-called proof of the errancy of the Bible. So is it possible that another, that there's a plausible interpretation other than uh, these hundreds of thousands of years can be made for these forests? And the answer is yes. Uh, creation scientists have discovered that the evidence can be interpreted so that these forests are not in situ, but were instead rafted into their locations by catastrophic mud flows. Here we see uh, a Yellowstone petrified tree that is missing its root system. So I've, I'm pointing here with this arrow 
at where you would expect that the root ball would be on this tree. And starting here, we have the petrified tree running up here. That's what, what we're seeing. Um, this, uh, none, none of these, not just this one, but none of the vertical petrified trees or the horizontal or at other angle trees have complete root systems. The trunk and the root ball have been snapped off at or near the ground and on these trees, and one can assume that the bulk of the roots of the trees were left where the tree originally grew. In addition, the logs, branches, and twigs found in the area are oriented in a preferred direction, and that indicates movement by a fluid. Also, the fossilized matter in the layers comes from several habitats, some from mountainous areas and others from valley region, uh, regions. So let's summarize what we've learned uh, from that last slide regarding these Yellowstone fossil trees. They're missing root systems. The root balls are missing. The, trunk and, the trunks and root balls are snapped off at or near the, ground, near the ground level. The branches and twigs are oriented, indicating movement by a fluid. And fossilized matter in the, layer comes, in the various layers comes from many different uh, habitats. So after the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, additional evidence was uncovered that reinforces the creationist interpretation for the Yellowstone fossil trees. Because of this eruption, many trees were ripped from the ground and eventually made their way into the adjacent Spirit Lake. Uh, some of you, since you're Washingtonians, probably remember all this in 1980 through 82, and uh, so you're quite familiar at least with the event. Now, um, some, uh, some of the trees were snapped in two, others were pulled out of the ground with a root ball attached. At first, these trees typically floated horizontally, as we're used to seeing uh, logs float in the water. Uh, but after some months, many of them began to turn and float upright with the root balls pointed downward. And this slide here is a, a cartoon which shows what happened at Spirit Lake. So this is the uh, water area of Spirit Lake, and here we see a, a horizontal floating tree. And then we see uh, depicted also some vertical trees that are uh, floating in that vertical upright position. Some of them were starting to get buried by the sediments that were settling out of Spirit Lake after the eruption. And, uh, and of course, some of them ended up being waterlogged and floating horizontally to the, to the bottom of the lake. Now this is a photo, an actual photograph, of a number of logs in Spirit Lake that at the time of the photo are oriented more or less in the vertical position. You can see there's not just a few, there's quite a few in that photo alone. Now years after the original eruption of Mount St. Helens when the Army Corps of Engineers lowered the, the level of Spirit Lake to prevent the possibility of a catastrophic dam burst, this particular tree was found in an upright position. And it's quite clear it did not originally grow in that position. Uh, that was another piece of evidence that indicates how logs can end up vertically after a cat catastrophe such as Mount St. Helens. Uh, those last slides and, and that information is, uh, there's a lot more information about that in a book by John Morris and Steve Austin. It's called Footprints in the Ash. I don't know if any of the guys have that here today, but it is an excellent book for understanding this phenomenon of uh, the trees ending up vertical in uh, sediments. Um, I wanted to uh, mention to you, too, that uh, there was a creation scientist that did some pioneer work and studied the formation of these petrified trees back in Yellowstone. And his na name was Dr. Harold Coffin. And in 1983, Dr. Coffin uh, wrote a book called The Origin of Design, and in that book he proposed a model for how the trees, uh, the trees, the plant debris, and the other matter were swept into the strata so as to end up like they are found today in Yellowstone National Park. Interestingly, during his research and some subsequent research, the sign that used to be uh, put in the, in the Yellowstone National Park explaining all these thousands of years and all these successive forests was removed by the National Park Service. So the, they could see that their 
that their explanation that they had used for decades was uh, not as good as the new creationist explanation. In 2005, Dr. Coffin updated his explanation with this model. And both of these models were based on the expectations of the worldwide fl Genesis flood, uh, where there would be cataclysmic, hydraulic, tectonic, and volcanic actions with unbelievably rapid burial. Well, let's leave Yellowstone and move to Joggins, an old coal mining town located on the shore of the Bay of Fundy in Nova, Nova Scotia. So this uh, picture here is of eastern Canada. And I know Heinz and his wife are originally, or not originally, but they lived in Canada for a while, so they're probably familiar with this area. And then this is an uh, exploded view of the, uh, the area, and Joggins is right here, so we're looking at the Bay of Fundy runs right along there. So on uh, July 30th of 1842, Sir Charles Lyell, the grand promoter of uniformitarianism, wrote this, uh, that I'm going to quote to you in a minute, uh, in a letter to his sister, Mary Ann. It says, quote, We have just returned from an expedition of three days to the Strait, which divides Nova Scotia from New Brunswick, whither I went to see a, where I went to see a forest of fossil coal trees, the most wonderful phenomenon, perhaps, I have ever seen. So upright do the trees stand, or so perpendicular to the strata in the ever-wasting cliffs, every year a new crop being brought into view, as the violent tides of the Bay of Fundy and the intense frost of the winters there combine to destroy, undermine, and sweep away the old one. Trees 25 feet high, and some have been seen 40 feet, piercing the beds of sandstone and terminating downwards in the same beds, usually coal." Unquote. Of course, since the time of Lyell, the secular interpretation is that the strata at Joggins was laid down over a period of about 50 million years, beginning about 300 million years ago. Now, this uh, prevailing secular idea that the petrified trees and numerous coal seams in the Joggins cliffs are in situ, secular geog uh, geologists spec spot, uh, postulate that there were numerous long periods of growth of bogs that slowly form coal at lower depths. Repeated transgressions of the sea buried these coal seams and engulfed the trees. That's the secular view. In this uh, photograph here, you can see uh, a person here, and there's uh, one of these fossilized polystrate trees, and here we see one running from here up to this point here. Now, creation scientist Dr. Harold Coffin that I mentioned to you earlier, who had done the study at Yellowstone, and Ian Juby have studied the Joggins fossil cliffs at great length. Mr. Juby has documented over 30 polystrate lycopods and dozens of polystrate calamites. Now, lycopods and calamites were giant hollow reeds. Uh, these are uh, types of plants that still exist today. However, we don't see them growing to this size. Nowadays are much smaller. Now, uh, Ian Juby believes that the Joggins evidence makes it clear that great thicknesses of sediments do not require long periods of time to form. Uh, Mr. Juby has a complete paper about these Joggins polystreet fossils on his website, ianjuby.org, where he interprets the evidence as indication of rapid burial. Dr. Coffin's research at Joggins produced numerous lines of evidence that the trees, along with masses of plant material, had been transported by water to the site where they're now found, and all were then buried under conditions of rapid sedimentation, uh, petrification, and carbonization followed. So his, what he found at Joggins was very similar to what he found at Yellowstone. Now, Dr. Coffin provided this summary of the evidence for his aforementioned hypothesis about Joggins. It says that uh, he found this evidence. He found an absence of soil zones. So if these, uh, if these plants had grown there, they didn't have anything to grow in. He found unusual plant fossils within the hollow stumps. He found remarkable preservation of delicate fossils. He found diagonal trees. He found abundant presence of the marine tube worm, Sporobus. So if these, had, if these uh, trees had been in situ, 
why would you find a marine tube worm in the trees? And of course, he found these polystrate trees as well. This hypothesis of, uh, for abrupt catastrophe and against millions of years is even today pretty much totally ignored by uniformitarian geologists. Creationist uh, Ord and Gisicke comment about this attitude by writing, quote, uniformitarian geologists dismiss polystrate trees with the magic wand of local rapid burial, even in situations where the trees are transported into place. Other than the existence of polystrate trees, uniformitarian geologists do not provide evidence for local rapid burial within their paradigm. The only time that they will allow for local rapid burial is when you're talking about polystrate trees. Moreover, even if rapidly buried, the fossils also must be rapidly petrified. Otherwise, they would eventually rot underground, and that uh, emphasis is by me. So, uniformitarian geologists say they have no problem with polystrate fossil trees. With a wave of the hand, they contribute them to local floods and say the trees buried in them can last for years or decades. But if that is the case, what happened to the millions of years? They seem to want to have it both ways, and that is not logical and is counterintuitive and is another indicator of the strong faith basis for this way of thinking. Their paradigm requires the total rejection of any evidence for catastrophe that might indicate the reality of a worldwide flood. In the Ord, Ord and Gesicke research from open pit coal mines in Alaska, the authors argue that the uniformitarian model of coal formation and the presence of multiple coal seams demands slow deposition. But the polystrate trees defy this uh, interpretation, instead imply rapid deposition of all the strata. So the uniformitarian method just does not match up, or the uniformitarian model doesn't match up to what you see. Here we see in this coal mine a, 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 a polystreet tree there. Uh, these are existing, an existing forest up here to give you an idea of scale. Um, so the two options are slow deposition locally over long periods of time, or rapid deposition of the strata with the trees included. Which option seems more logical to you? If option one, then why didn't the trees rot away? Here we see some more of these polystreet trees in this uh, coal, old coal mine. Uh, here's some more of them here in this picture. Another one here. And uh, a final look at the Alaska coal mine polystreet of uh, a tree there. So far, the emphasis in my presentation this evening has been on petrified trees buried in sedimentary layers of either slate, limestone, sandstone, or coal. But now let's shift uh, to those situations where other types of fossils are found in multiple pancaked sedimentary layers. This is a photomicrograph of the silica skeleton of a small single-celled alga called a diatom. When alive, these diatoms commonly inhabit the ocean near its surface in enormous numbers. There are so many of these algae in existence that their skeletons can accumulate in layers hundreds of feet thick. When found on land, these layers are called diatomite or diatomaceous earth. The diatom skeleton shown in this uh, image here is about the same width as the thickness of a single human hair. One gram of diatomite may contain up to 400 million of these silica skeletons. Here's a photo of a diatom skeleton in the shape of a triangle that is even smaller than the one we saw in the last slide. Notice the fine detail in the construction of the skeletons of these animals. These skeletons look to be very carefully designed. This is another of these amazing diatom skeletons. I'm aware of polystrate fossils and diatomite layers in eastern Washington and California and also in the country of Peru. So let's, let's go to Peru. Uh, today we're going to focus on the diatomite polystrate fossils that are found in Peru. In this map we see uh, off in the inset here, this is uh, South America. Here's where Peru is located. And so we take Peru out and we have Peru here. And we're going to be looking at this area in, in, of Peru uh, where we're going to be looking at these fossils. Um, this uh, area, in this area, has been found at least 346 whales, 
as well as some other fossils that are buried in sedimentary diatomite. Uh, even fossilized ground sloths have been found in the area. But the primary thing that is found is uh, uh, these whales. The, the photo that we see here is of the, uh, of a, the formation uh, where the fossils were found. The stratigraphy is well exposed and there's no vegetation. You don't see anything growing on here. You see these layers, the horizontal layers, because there's no rain in this area of Peru. The lower part of these hills is largely sandstone down under here with some diatomaceous sediment. And the upper part that contains most of the fossils is mostly this diatomaceous siltstone. In this photo, we see an excavated fossil, a fossil whale, that was found completely articulated except for one missing flipper. This is the front end here, and this is the back end here of this whale. These are the types of whales that are fossilized in Peru. Um, the, the fin wheel and the, and the side whale, and they're similar to those modern whales. Here in this slide, we just see uh, one of the American scientists who reported on these fossils, and he is using high-precision GPS in order to be able to map the location and the relative location of all these fossils. Uh, the leading American scientists were from Loma Linda University and Southwestern Adventist University. <laughs> this research was published in the years 2002 and 2004. Here we see a map uh, or a map chart that was prepared by the researchers showing the distribution of the fossil whales in a plan view. And over 340 whales were identified in this research. The fossil whales encompassed an area of about 370 acres. Notice that on this particular map, north is down in this direction, and this is the Pacific Ocean out here. This is the stratigraphic distribution of the whales that were found, mostly in the diatomaceous siltstone of, uh, of, or diatomite. The left ordinate here, this left ordinate of this graph, is uh, dimension in meters of elevation. So you can see 150, 200, 250. Remember, a meter's a little over a yard. And so you can see that, the, that these fossil whales are in quite a variation so far as the depth that they were found. The whale skeletons were partially mineralized, and remarkably, baleen from five whales was discovered preserved. Uh, one would think that there should be no doubt that these well-preserved whales entomb, entombed in diatomite that this indicates rapid burial. In fact, the authors of the report on the findings wrote the following, quote, the most viable explanation for whale preservation seems to be rapid burial, fast enough to cover whales 16 to 42 feet long and 20 inches thick within a few weeks or months to account for the whales with well-preserved bones and some soft tissues. And that was uh, written by Leonard R. Brand, one of the researchers. Of course, it would be my personal observation that this process could have happened even quicker uh, than a few weeks, but we don't know that one way or the other. Notice, too, that the whale fossils are found distributed in layers that accumulate to a total of about 500 feet. And there, so there's nothing uniformitarian about this find. This is a photo of another excavated uh, fossil whale in that Pisco formation of Peru. Uh, you can see a man here so that you get an idea of scale. This photo shows a partly disarticulated Peruvian uh, fossil whale. The whale's skull was found several meters from the lower left of this photo. And uh, I think this is a likely indication of catastrophic conditions at the time of the burial. Here we see workers excavating the whale skeleton they named Fernanda. They did not excavate all the whales they discovered. The last word I read was that they had excavated less than a dozen of the over 300 whales they found. This side slide shows the fossil whale skeleton named Fernanda completely uncovered. Now a slab of baleen was found lying on top of the flipper on the left side of this photo. Right here they found a slab of baleen from, uh, we assume, that whale. And in this uh, slide we see that baleen. This, is a, this right here is a photo from a plan view of the, of the baleen. And then uh, this upper section here is a cross section cut through that baleen. And then this is a, uh, 
uh, microscopic enlargement of the surface, surface taken right there. So this type of preservation is another indication of rapid burial. Before the baleen tissues that are similar to our fingernails had time to decay. This photomicrograph is of a portion of the diatom rich sediment in which the whales were found. The diatom skeletons were often broken but did not show evidence of dissolution. These fossil whales seem to have been buried in thick, muddy, diatomaceous sediment that illustrate the conditions expected from the descriptions of the Genesis record. <coughs> So here's a summary of the findings that uh, we can uh, interpret there at the catastrophic, as being due to catastrophic burial. There were 340 whales were buried in a 500 foot deep formation of sediments. The 20 inch, up to 20 inch thick skeletons were found in layers, one on top of the other. The skeletons had well preserved bones. Some soft tissues are remaining, and that's difficult to, remain, to explain with the millions of years scenario and the diatom skeletons and the sediments were not dissolved. Nevertheless, even with this type of evidence, many evolutionists continue to cling to the paradigm of slow deposition over long periods of time for the explanation of the formation of fossils. This diagram that we see on the slide here is typical of the explanation for fossil formation found in literally hundreds of textbooks and other representations in museums, school books and encyclopedias. I believe that uh, the first two stages of this de depiction are in extreme error and do not at all match reality. So what we have is we, we have these step one, step two, step three, step four. Step one is that the animal in the uh, lake or in the uh, ocean or uh, by the stream or whatever floats down, lands on the bottom, and over long periods of time, finally, it gets covered up by sediment. And then more and more sediment over the millions of years covers up the animal. And then millions of years later, erosion finally uh, uncovers a portion of, a, of the uh, animal. And the paleontologist can go dig out the rest of the skeleton and know what they found. As I said, uh, these two, por two sections up here are entirely outside reality. And so we'll take a look at that. So according to the evolutionary scenario, the vertebrate dead animal on its way to fossilization drops through the water of a stream, river, or lake, as shown in the left hand rendition. Then its soft parts decompose and its hard skeletal parts are slowly covered with sediments over eons of time. This process is never, this process is never seen in reality. As the animals normally do not sink in water, and would not be preserved for fossilization unless they were completely and rapidly buried. Next, we're going to look at a real-world demonstration of the unsinkable whale. This story I'm going to tell you next is uh, uh, from an article by Dr. Taz Walker in Creation Magazine in March of 2002. So here we see a dead whale floating in the ocean off of South Australia. Worried officials, fearing the whale would become a hazard to shipping or wash ashore causing an environmental crisis, enlisted the police bomb squad to sink it. So the bomb squad placed three explosive charges in the whale's belly to blow holes in its side so it could fill with water. The carcass was towed away from the coast and the charges detonated. Official reports said the operation was entirely successful and the whale no longer presented a problem. However, the whale refused to sink and dramatically demonstrated the flaws in the standard secular theory for how fossils form. The damaged whale continued to float, just as does the dead goldfish in its bowl. Even when the remains eventually do sink, the scavenged, the scavenged skeleton does not fossilize. What really happens on the ocean floor is that for months the carcass is alive with hordes of scavengers. And in 10 years or so, the bones are slowly consumed until they totally disappear and the site is absolutely clean. This real process is attested to by Craig Smith of the University of Hawaii, who has been studying corpses at the bottom of the ocean for decades. Experiments in lakes have been conducted with similar results. So we can assume that the remains of our whale eventually ended up at the bottom. 
But clearly, dead animals will not fossilize in the ocean under normal circumstances. This is because their scattered bones do not lie around long enough to be covered by sediment. To be fossilized, a creature must be buried rapidly to protect it from all these marine scavengers. A much better explanation for Peruvian whales and the trillions of other fossils found today in the rock record is the worldwide flood at the time of Noah some 4,500 years ago. So the ubiquitous evolutionary scenario must be removed from all of the books and displays in order for truth to prevail regarding the process of fossilization. So kids, just go home and rip them out, rip it out, okay? Yeah. Well, the fifth area we're gonna to move to is the Green River Formation, located, uh, as you can see in this map here in the southwest corner of Wyoming. Uh, some of it down in Utah, some of it's in uh, Colorado as well. Uh, millions of life forms have been found fossilized in this geologic formation. This slide shows the lakes that evolutionists have speculated. You won't find those blue areas actually as lakes now. They're, they don't exist um, at this time, but they are speculated to exist, exist at the time that the fossils were formulated. Uh, of course, a creationist hypothesis for the fossils is that they were likely formed during the one year long worldwide flood at the time of Noah. On this map, uh, we see circle, this circle right here is the area of Wyoming where many millions of fossil fish and other fossils have been recovered and are in the process of continuous recovery, mostly by private fossil diggers. Now, this is unusual that, the, that this area is pretty much open to private fossil diggers. Um, throughout uh, the rest of uh, the country, uh, fossils are protected by governmental agencies for the most part, unless they're on private land. And there are so many millions of these that there's more than anybody ever would want in the way of the government. So um, they're allowing for all these landowners to sell their, uh, to allow people to come in to their quarries and dig up these uh, fossils, mainly fish fossils. Uh, this right here is a yellow circle, and that is the location of the Fossil Butte National Monument. And right outside of this large circle is a smaller circle that represents Kemmer, Wyoming. When my wife and I were there digging fossils, probably the most uh, interesting thing we discovered was that Kemmer, Wyoming is the home of the very first J.C. Penney store. Who would have ever thought that? And then the smaller, oh, so smaller circles here are representative of various quarries. Here's a photo of a typical fossil fish limestone slab with numerous perch and herring that were uncovered from the area near Kemmer, Wyoming. From the previous discussion of the whales, we can surmise that these fish were rapidly buried under much water-laden sediment, at least if you had the biblical creationist worldview, that's what you would expect. The current secular explanation for these fish fossils is for rapid burial in an anaerobic environment. Now, anaerobic means without oxygen. So they, they have to uh, uh, have this anaerobic ex explanation, meaning that the only way that they can possibly understand how these, this, so much of this is, is still in existence is because there was no air, absolutely no air to, uh, to uh, help uh, oxidize the material. So at least in this case we can agree on the rapid burial part. However, they rely, rely more on the lack of oxygen than on truly rapid burial as our understanding of it would be. And they remain uniformitarian in their explanations and, uh, and that, of course that totally precludes a biblical catastrophic uh, rapid burial explanation. Here we see is what is called the 18 inch layer because of its usual thickness is about 18 inches, uniformitarians uh, believe that this 18 inch thick layer represents 4,000 years of depositional time for the supposed fossil lake in which the sediments and the fossils were formed. Now if correct, then each year would represent a thickness of four and one half thousandths of an inch, or about the thickness of, one, of two human hairs. So that would be a year if, 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 uh, if they're correct. Here we see a polished section, a specimen of an 18-inch layer, showing uh, what the uniformitarians believe 
are annual lamini or varves, this is what they call them. So if you count those all up and, and uh, figure, divide the, the number that you see there by the n amount of time they think it takes, you get that four and a half thousandths of an inch. In this slide, we see a plan view of a typical fish fossil uh, prior to recovery from the sedimentary rock. These fossils are always thicker than the varve thickness and can be seen here protruding above the layer that's been split from this 18-inch layer. So you sort of, uh, they've uh, lifted up the layer above it, and, but you can see how much this protrudes above the layer that it's encapsulated in. Now many of the fossils uh, that are found uh, in thicker section of limestone than what we see in the 18-inch layer and, uh, and not always, it's not always possible to know where some of these fossils come from. But here we see a five foot long garfish fossil that's on display at the Fossil Butte National Monument. The fossil fish had been greatly flattened by overburden during the fossilization process, but it still had a thickness of at least a half an inch. Here we see a photo of a turtle fossil at Fossil Butte National Monument Museum. This is the trionics genus of a soft shell, a shell turtle that is still found alive and well in many places in Africa and Asia. Now if you take a look by the table out there, our, uh, our book table, you'll find an exact replica of this turtle. And you can see uh, for yourself uh, how thick the thing is and, and just imagine what you would imagine this turtle would look like after if it took a year for four and a half thousandths to accumulate on top of it. Uh, there, note too that there are two holes in the back of this fossil that are thought by some to be bite marks from an alligator or crocodile. And you can see those bite marks on the, the replica that we have out there. We see this uh, large palm frond that was at the same museum, also with substantial thickness. And uh, this is another gar fish that was on display at the Ulrich Studios. It's located just outside the fossil Butte Monument. I measured it. It's five foot four inches long. And it sort of looks flat in that photo, but it's, it, you can't tell the three dimensionality of it. It's at least one inch thick. According to the previously calculated four and a half thousandths of an inch per year deposition rate of the uniformitarians, it would take 220 years for the sedimentary varves to cover the entire fish after being, after being flattened to a final one inch thickness. The question is, how could the fish remain preserved for this length of time? I think the uniformitarian hypothesis is unreasonable. This is another polystrate fossil that speaks against millions of years. Here's another fish, uh, another fossil from the area that's even thicker than the garfish. This is of a horse uh, that has been found in that area. And this is a slab. And you'll notice that they're also located in that same slab, a number of fish fossils, all in the same fossil slab. The assigned value for your interest, if you're interested, of this extremely rare Green River Formation fossil is in the range of $2 million. It is for sale. You can get it for about $2 million right now. So next we're going to move to what we call trace fossils, polystrate trace fossils. And we're going to move to uh, the state of Colorado. Most of you probably know where the state of Colorado is. Uh, we're going to consider trace fossils, and, and when we're talking trace fossils in this case, we're talking about animal tracks that move through multiple sedimentary layers. These examples of trace uh, polystrate fossils come to us from creationist dinosaur hunter and author Mr. Terry P. Bay. Some of you may be familiar with him. He first published the existence of these tracks in volume 19, number one, in the January-February 2014 issue of Creation Matters put out by the Creation Research Society. And this slide is shown southwestern Colorado where the little town of Slick Rock is located. It is near this town that three distinct trackways are found that traverse multiple sandstone sedimentary beds of supposed Jurassic age. All of the following photos that I'm going to be showing you of this area are at the courtesy of Mr. Bay. This site has been known by the locals for some time and is called the cat tracks due to their shape that look like footprints of cats. Um, as can be seen in this early photograph, this photograph is from a number of decades ago, 
There are three distinct trackways that travel across four separate sedimentary bedding planes. And in a little bit, I'll, I'll help you delineate those bedding planes. These prints have clearly not been carved into the sandstone. They are imprints into the sandstone. Here's a more recent photo of the site where the cat-like footprints traverse the light gray fine to coarse grain sandstone. The lower two beds are horizontally bedded while the upper two are cross bedded. Erosion has diminished the number and quality of the trackways since their discovery, like we saw in the first photo, but 10 footprints can still be identified in the leftmost trackway that extend through all four layers. And that would be these tracks right here, the ones that are, are most uh, easy to see. Now, we would say that the existence of these trackways is strong evidence for quick formation of all four of the sedimentary layers and for formation of the tracks while all the layers are still relatively soft. Also, the large extent of similar formations over many thousands of square miles further indicates that this was a, a large event. You can continue and see this formation for quite a distance away from the area. The secular interpretation for these rocks is that they are mid-Jurassic, and so in the secular m mindset, that's 120 to 150 million years old, long before any large mammals supposedly evolved. So are they indeed cat tracks? Well, if they are cat tracks, then of course that can't possibly be because in the evolutionary viewpoint, cats hadn't evolved yet. Mr. Bay's research indicates that as a possibility, it is possible that they're cats, but he has not ruled out that the trackways could have been made by other animals, uh, perhaps bipedal dinosaur or something, some other creature we're not aware of. The distinct track preservation suggests that they were lithified quickly enough to preserve the footprints, and some of the prints even show evidence of mud push-up. These facts speak against the secular view that the sediments are aeolian, that is, caused uh, from wind blowing sand into a position, into a sand dune. You wouldn't be able to get a mud push-up on a sand dune. Here is a large view of the slanted exposure again, and next I'm going to uh, show you the, uh, on this slide, the demarcation line. So here, uh, this line demarks the, the lowest sedimentary layer. This is the next, the second, and there's the third, and up here is the fourth. So, I believe I've shown you that polystrate fossils are a better indication of, of catastrophe and rapid burial, burial rather than evolution of millions of years. But are there any creationist proposed mechanisms within biblical, within biblical presuppositions that would help us explain aspects of the burial and sorting of the fossils? Let me talk to you now about rapid burial combined with wave-loaded liquefaction a mechanism that may help explain some of what we find in the rock record. So uh, creationists are pretty much all in one in accord about this rapid burial and water-laden set uh, sediments. But uh, now I'm going to introduce you to a phenomenon called wave-loaded liquefaction. What is liquefaction? Well, in geology, liquefaction refers uh, to the process where uh, by saturated, unconsolidated sediments are transformed into a substance that acts like a fluid or a liquid. And what's the primary application of liquefaction in science and engineering? The answer is that earthquakes can cause soil liquefaction where loosely packed waterlogged sediments come loose from the intense shaking of the earthquake. Here's a photo of a resulting catastrophe that can be caused by earthquake-induced liquefaction. What happens is the earthquake vibration causes this process of liquefaction. The foundation now becomes nothing but oozy, oozy mud, and the buildings fall over. Um, here's, a, here's another photo of an entire building that was destroyed by earthquake-induced liquefaction. We can see uh, in this Japanese port dock what happened to that because of earthquake-induced liquefaction. It's destroyed all kinds of infrastructure, including bridges like this one. And this photo shows a three-foot drop in the elevation of a building foundation caused by liquefaction during a recent earthquake in Japan. The owners of these cars probably had no concern about the parking lot where they parked their cars prior to the earthquake that induced this liquefaction. 
So next I'm going to show you a fairly simple experiment to better demonstrate liquefaction. And this is an experiment that you can also conduct yourself in your garage or your backyard. I don't recommend that you do this on the kitchen table, but um, oftentimes creationists and the Christians are criticized because all we do is criticize the science. Well, we can do the science ourselves, and this is one that's easy for anyone with any sort of mechanical ability to do. So for this experiment, what you need is a clear two to three gallon capacity plastic container. Uh, you fill the container a third to half full of regular mason sand or beach sand. And the little plastic bottle here <coughs> represents what we're going to call our underground tank. And then this concrete brick represents our building. You can see it even has windows in it. And uh, then the rubber mallet here is going to be our device for inducing the vibrations into the water-saturated sand. So here we are, ready for our experiment. The small bottle has been buried in the sand, and the brick is sitting stably on the sand. And here's an elevation view of what we've got. Prior to the area you, that you can't see the little bottle, it's underneath the sand here, buried. And then here's the um, building, and it's, uh, there's enough strength in the sand to support it stably there. And here we begin our light tapping with our rubber mallet. And you just, it's just tap, 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 tap. And uh, in less than a minute of light rhythmic tapping to the side of the container at the sand level, the bottle pops up out of the sand and the brick falls over. Notice too how wet uh, the surface of the sand has become. This little experiment demonstrates liquefaction a process that has caused billions of dollars of damage in recent earthquakes alone. So we, we talk about uh, rapid burial and water-laden sediments, and now we're going to talk about the phenomenon of wave-loaded liquefaction. Notice I'm not talking earthquake-loaded liquefaction, which we now have some sort of a feel for because we've uh, seen these photos of these buildings and other things falling over. And how, So how does liquefaction apply to our subject today of the burial of fossils? The answer comes from creation science researcher Dr. Walt Brown, who has written about the, this related phenomenon he has named wave-loaded liquefaction. Remember, uh, I assume most of you have been, walked along the beach, uh, uh, many of you probably barefooted. If you went into the surf and stood in the sand as the waves rolled in, you found that the sand supported your weight only until the wave returned to the ocean. When the wave went back out, the sand beneath your feet became loose and mushy, and your feet sank down into the sand, and it was more difficult to walk. This experience demonstrates a small example of the type of liquefaction Dr. Brown has named wave-loaded liquefaction. The explanation for this phenomenon is, is that at the height of each wave, water was forced down into the sand. As the water returned to the ocean, the water forced into the sand gushes back out, and in doing so, it lifts the topmost sand particles, forming the mushy mixture, and your feet sink into the sand. In addition, as the waves continually bombard the beach, the sand is lifted and lowered, as well as moved back and forth horizontally, and with each wave cycle, the current moves toward the beach as the liquefaction lifts the sand particles, and the sand particles are nudged toward the beach. If this process did not occur, beaches would not be sandy. So now you understand why beaches are sandy. It's due to this process. Now this is Dr. Brown's diagram for explaining wave-loaded liquefaction. And of course the whole reason for this is that he sees much application to the worldwide Genesis flood. The wave cycle begins in the, in the left uh, portion of this uh, picture here. Uh, with a, with a, here's the high peak of the wave and it forces the, this all this weight forces the water down into the sand and compacts the sand. And as the wave trough approaches, that compressed water is released here. And then the water then flows up through the sand seafloor, lifting the sediments, starting at the top of the sedimentary column. Starting here, lifts this first. And keep in mind that in a worldwide flood scenario, these sediments were hundreds to thousands of feet thick. Now, it's going to be hard for creation scientists alone to comprehend all this and to extrapolate it to the worldwide flood, 
but it is a process that can be understood from our understanding of what happens at the beach. Now, experiments have shown that this wave-loaded liquefaction process tends to sort the particles and that lenses of water, here we're seeing a lens here, that lenses of water form along nearly horizontal paths if the sediments below these horizontal paths are more permeable than those above. So more water flows up into each lens than out its roof. This is Dr. Brown's wave-loaded liquefaction demonstration apparatus. Basically, if you can imagine a teeter-totter here, and uh, these blocks in here are just to hold this teeter-totter horizontal. And what he has is that he has a, a, a pipe, a tube here, that's connected to the bottom of these two bottles. And these bottles are supported at the ends of the horizontal uh, square tubing here. And when he takes the blocks of wood out, you get this teeter-totter action. And you get this process of, of water coming up through the sediments in these bottles. And through this process, he has confirmed his hypothesis. He verified that once liquefaction begins, sedimentary particles fall or rise relative to each other, sorting themselves into layers, each having particles with similar size, shape, and density. Buried objects with the density of plants and dead animals float up through the sediments until they reach a liquefaction lens. It is proposed that the same would have happened on a much grander scale for plants and animals buried during the worldwide flood. And in my experience as a, sort of a, a specialist in paleontology, I find that uh, the this so-called progression of simple to a, a, to complex in the fossils can be totally reversed in some places. It can it, you can get all different sorts of different combinations of uh, of these uh, animals in the sediments and plants. So, um, if if wave-loaded liquefaction was indeed a, uh, indeed a mechanism in play during the Genesis flood. Perhaps it could help us explain the fossils found in the 18-inch layer of the Green River Formation. If uh, wave-loaded liquefaction was a mechanism in play during the Genesis Flood, perhaps it could help explain the massive amounts of limestone with millions of fossils found in the Kemmerer, Wyoming area. So if you are wanting to learn more about uh, the wave-loaded liquefaction and how it would apply to the uh, fossils that are found by the billions throughout the Earth, uh, Please see Dr. Brown's In the Beginning, his book. And you can get his total book. It's available online at his website. And he, he updates it uh, on a regular basis. And there's no cost whatsoever to see everything that he has to say about this and the worldwide flood. Well, here's some conclusions I think can be made from the material I presented today. Uh, first, the uh, polystrate fossils around the world reinforce the biblical record of a relatively recent worldwide flood, and they undermine uniformitarianism. Secondly, unif the Yellowstone National Park petrified forest can be best understood within a biblical creationist worldview. Thirdly, the common evolutionary explanation for how fossils are formed is most certainly incorrect. Genesis flood conditions of rapid burial under huge amounts of water laden Sediments better explains the process. Number four, wave-loaded liquefaction during the flood may be a creationist discovered mechanism to help explain the rock record. So over the past 30 years, I have been looking into paleontology subjects using the Bible as my basis for my presuppositions. In addition to what I just covered today, I have discovered what I describe as 18 foundational facts of biblical paleontology. And I'm going to run through these quickly for you now. There are a few sheets of those out on my table out there that are left. Um, and if you would like one, there's still one there, feel free to take it. Now, these are what I call the foundational facts of biblical paleontology. Number one, fossils are almost always formed by rapid and, burial, and complete burial. Number two, fossils are often found in assemblages. That is what we call fossil graveyards or bone jumbles. Number three, fossil assemblages indicate catastrophe. Number four, fossils are found in regions all over the earth, even on mountaintops. Number five, most, about 95% of the fossils of the world, are marine invertebrates, that is, animals like clams that have no backbone. Number six, the geologic time scale is a mental abstraction and is not an observable reality. Number seven, the sedimentary layers of this geologic column have been correlated 
almost entirely by fossils. Number eight, measurable variation within a kind of life form can occur quite rapidly. Number nine, variation within a kind has not been and cannot be scientifically demonstrated to lead to evolution, by what, which I mean when I say evolution, that is change from one kind of life to another kind. Number 10, variation within a kind can be quite extensive, but always has definite limits. Number 11, biogenesis, the law that life only comes from life, is indeed a law of nature that has never been observed to fail. Number 12, all scientists, no matter their worldviews, observe the exact same evidence. Their interpretations of the evidence vary according to their accepted presuppositions. Number 13, true transitional fossils have not been found, and there is no scientific reason to believe that they exist. The missing links continue to be missing. Number 14, no life form found living or fossilized today is truly primitive or simple. Number 15, there is little evidence that fossils are now being formed in lake beds, rivers, or oceans. Number 16, the present is determined by the past, not vice versa, and uniformitarianism, the present, which is stated as, quote, the present is the key to the past, is an assumed principle of, natural, of naturalism and not a scientific observation. Number 17, fossil life forms are in many cases identical or very similar to modern life forms. This is what we call living fossils. And finally, number 18, ongoing variation within a kind often results in a reduction of future options for environmental adaptation for that kind. That's sort of a comment about natural selection. So, uh, here's the big question. If the biblical creation explanation for fossil formation, polystrate fossils, petrified forests, and paleontology in general best match rea reality, why then do so many outside and inside the church reject the Bible and the Creator and cling to, to belief in evolution and millions of years? Well, I think the Bible provides the best answer to that big question, and that is uh, as we read in Romans, uh, for the since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they, they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, continuing on in Romans 1, God gave them over to sexual impurity, shameful lust, and a, dep and a depraved mind. Well, here's my uh, coming to a, a close here. Here's my website address uh, for more information on creation science and biblical apologetics topics. Uh, my website is creationengineeringconcepts.org, and uh, you'll find written and audio, audio articles on creation science on that website. I also have a weekly blog there called The Biblical Interpretation, and I get somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 hits every month on that biblical interpretation. So if you don't like creation science, you might like the blog. And then, of course, you can get uh, books and uh, DVDs on the website as well. So thank you very much for your courteous attention and uh, now I guess it's time to see if we uh, can answer any questions you might have on this topic. Okay, well, let's give uh, JD a hand for that presentation. So he's obviously covered a, a large area of facts there, and I'm sure that has generated some questions in your mind. So think about a question to ask, and I'll bring the microphone around, and if you have a question, just raise your hand, and uh, you've got a chance to ask it. And, and while you're thinking of the question, we're, we're going to take a free will offering if the two folks could come up and help with that. And uh, feel free to contribute to the ministry that we have here. Uh, don't feel compelled, but uh, you're certainly welcome to help us uh, to do that ministry. So we have a, a few questions here. And uh, let me just bring the microphone around.
Yeah, my question is associated with, uh, you talk about uh, fossils. And we, the world knows today that we have fossil fuels called petroleum. And uh, I have a, a serious question about since we find that in, in the deepest of the ocean or below sea levels. And the interesting part to me is that uh, petroleum is not solvable in water. That vegetation stuff that de decomposes is. So is petroleum a fossil fuel? Well, in the sense that uh, most people would say that most of the uh, petroleum, for example, and coal, um, it's, it's much clearer in coal because you can see, oftentimes in coal, you can see remnants of the plants that made up the coal. Uh, so most people, uh, even creationists, would say that there's that they believe that a lot of the petroleum is as a result of large mats of vegetation that were accumulated during the worldwide flood. However, I'm also aware of some people, some some people who believe that petroleum is continuing to be created right along. I, I'm not at all an expert on petroleum or anything like that. I I only um, you know, I, would, I can say that I've seen quite a few fossils that were formed in coal and, uh, you know, have indications that uh, they were made from plants. Uh, the one thing I would also say is, is that there's very unlikely that the Sinclair, Sinclair oil uh, advertisements we saw so, for so many years are accurate. If you may, you may remember the Sinclair oil always had the, di the dinosaur on there and aged for millions of years. Well, it's not very likely that, very, that any, if, that, you know, there's very little, if any, of the fossil fuel that Sinclair oil sells was as a result of dinosaurs. Uh, I would say more likely plant material. But to give you an authoritative answer with regard to, I think, your underlying uh, question that you have, I'm, I'm not really an expert on uh, that. Uh, there, uh, there's a book that we sell on our table called Rocks Aren't Clocks by John K. Reed, a professional geologist, a creationist. And he explains uh, a lot about uh, geology from his perspective. And you can, get a, you can email him, and he would be a person that could uh, much better answer this question for you. Is there any other questions around that uh, you'd like to ask? I, I know some of these questions that are being asked uh, are uh, covered in some of the answer books, creation answer books, and uh, some of those books are available there. You might look to see if that uh, question is answered. What was your experience in transitioning from an evolutionist to a creationist? How did that work? OK, well. <clears throat> It, it worked like this. Uh, this is my testimony. I uh, grew up in the church, sang in the choir as a boy, and uh, by the time I was in my 30s, I was involved in church leadership. But uh, as I grew up in the church, I was an analytical type kid, and I, and I was very interested in science and math. I did well in those source courses and things. And so I was not able to get any answers from youth pastors or pastors that I had uh, to my questions with regard to origins, for example. Mostly they would like to say things like, well, that's not important, just trust in Jesus. And the other thing I noticed was uh, the church at that time, and, and so to some extent, even yet today, you'll find that a lot of the kids that are accepted and, and very active in the youth uh, in the youth uh, of, of the church are not your scientifically oriented type kids. They, they tend to, uh, there tends to be more of an acceptance of those with musical, cap musical ability, uh, ability to converse and get along socially and so forth. And so a lot of us kids that are more introverted, more analytical, we, we sort of get pushed, or at least my experience was we got pushed out got pushed out of the church so far as uh, getting answers to the questions we had. And so um, 
by the, when I went to university, I had really no use for church. I, I, I was in the church, went to university, started out uh, going to be a physicist. All I got was evolution and millions of years. Then I changed to engineering because I found out how esoteric physics was and uh, didn't feel I had the money to go on. I, I would need to get a PhD if I was going to be any, do anything in physics. And so I transferred to engineering where, at that time, the evolutionary uh, underlying pretty much it was there, but it, it, there was no time for it because you had to learn how to build things that didn't fall down. You know, that was an important thing. You had to build machines that didn't blow up. That, that was what we, when we got into engineering, we couldn't sit up in our ivory tires and, and wonder about, you know, all these things that a lot of the scientists wonder about. Anyway, so uh, when we got, my wife and I got married and we started having children, then, oh, let's go back to the church. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea because, like I said, uh, that's where the good people are and we want to have our kids have, be around good people, right? And so I was, uh, I was uh, one of the leaders of the church, and I was giving a, uh, I was involved in a Genesis Bible study, and I, I waxed eloquently for everyone. The pastor was there, a lot of the leaders of the church were there, and I told them uh, in no uncertain terms that I knew that Genesis uh, chapters one through eleven were allegory, and uh, no one, no one uh, disputed my. Uh, assertions and a little bit, or at least that I, I don't remember that they did. So I left out, I walked out of there uh, pretty proud of myself. And uh, this guy, Jim, who was in the class, he walked up to me and he said, JD, I don't have the education you have. All I do is drive nails for a living. But he said, I, I got a favor to ask of you. Would you listen to this audio tape? And I said, sure, Jim, I'll listen to your audio tape. And it was an audio tape, a creation science audio tape. And uh, that blew my mind away. I had never heard anything like was in that. And so for uh, the next 20 years, uh, first thing I did was right away, um, you know, I was born again. And I uh, bowed down and uh, asked for forgiveness for my sins and accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and uh, had a, a new outlook on what, uh, what the church was all about. But then I fumed for 20 years of just, I studied all this stuff and, and I just couldn't understand why everybody didn't think like I did now, you know? Why, you know, I, I got it figured out. Why don't you have it figured out? Well, so then uh, in 2004 is when I started Creation Engineering Concepts, my personal ministry. And then in 2005, uh, I founded the Institute for Creation Science in Portland area there. And so, uh, that's what I do is, is a passion. Now, I, I'm re I just recently retired from engineering, so I don't, uh, I don't have to worry about uh, having the conflict of having to work anymore. So here, here I am.